Russia may have supremacy combat and military wise in Ukraine, but the squeeze economically speaking is tightening around Russia and its people. There's an exodus, a non-stop exodus of high-end, low-end companies, tech companies, brands, Louis Vuitton, the Hermes and the, the Zaras of the world from increasingly isolated Russia. Putin's powerful cronies, the oligarchs, are also facing increasing heat. And there is reported rising Russophobia across the world as the country continues to be isolated from the rest of the world. Here's a report from Moscow. All-out Russian attack bleeding Ukraine. But away from the death, destruction and fire, Moscow is silently bleeding too. While Putin is not personally hit, punitive global sanctions and business boycotts have begun to bite. Russians no longer have access to global super luxury apparel brands. British car maker Bentley, American brands Ford and Coca-Cola are no longer operating in Russia. Global furniture brand IKEA, which shut its shop, saw a massive rush at its outlets in Moscow on the last day of operation, as Russians rushed to own whatever was available. Russian banks are rushing to switch to Chinese card systems. In a rare move, Singapore also sanctioned four big Russian banks. Um. Actually, every day, every morning, breaks some news, uh, some bad news for all Russians and for all Ukrainian people, because um, the economic pressure yes. from the West continues to Russia. And, uh, for example, today uh, all Russians woke up to the announcement by Visa and Mastercard that their yeah. cards won't be legal in Russia very soon, and that Visa and Mastercard would withdraw from Russian market, and uh, that uh, our cards won't uh, work. Uh, outside of Russia, so everybody is like in panic. Putin's alleged cronies, the Russian super-rich, are fearing the loss of their yacht and private jets, as well as the freezing of their asset, as Western democracies try and exert pressure, hitting out at oligarchs to make Putin pay for his misadventure in Ukraine. India today has now gained access to the seized Lady M the super yacht of Russian oligarch Alexei Mordashov. The super luxury yacht is now moored in Imperia. I'm Paolo Vassal and I'm live from Imperia exclusively for India today. We are in the harbor and this behind me is the $65 million yacht of Alexei Mordashov, one of the richest oligarchs of Russia. It's a 52 meters boat and uh, its name is Lady M in honor of his wife. This is one of the yachts that has been taken by European authorities following the sanctions imposed to Russian millionaires. Russia's state-affiliated media also reported rising hate against Russian installations abroad. Vandals allegedly threw blue and yellow paint at this Russian community center in Vancouver, Canada. Bureau report, India Today. And joining us live from Moscow this evening is Tatiana Kukureva. She's deputy head of Sputnik News in Moscow. Tatiana, good to see you again. Thanks for your time and being with us here on India Today's coverage. Tatiana, I wanted to ask you, we just played out a report that updates our viewers about the number of different companies that are, uh, you, know, you know, who have stopped operations in Russia, MasterCard and Visa, among the latest to have done so. Many luxury brands have, uh, you know, for the moment at least, shut shop. Uh, uh, how is this being seen in Moscow at this time, Tatiana? Is this being seen, you know, with a sense of alarm? Or are people thinking, you know, this is happening now, but these companies will have to come back sooner or later? Good evening to you as well. Well, look, uh, first of all, 
the majority of these companies, um, if we're talking about American companies, that's mm -hmm. one story. If we're talking about European companies, for instance, IKEA and Hennes and Mauritz, you know, the, the brand, the huge company that is responsible for the brands like Kos, H&M, etc., they have not stopped working in Russia. They have paused for three months, and that's official, you know, that was uh, according to their official statements. So they are coming back, and they have paused for the period of time when the logistics are um, difficult, to, to say the least. Uh, in the same, at the same time, I'd say that, um, you know, it's a fair statement, a fair assessment of things that the majority of those companies will have to come back to Russia one way or another. It's a huge market. And as much as, uh, you know, as they uh, are trying to put pressure, again, you know, this is where things come become very, you know, questionable on the part of the uh, of our European partners because they say that they're, and even in your report, you say that they're trying to put pressure on the oligarchs. In the meantime, the, the real the, the real part of yes. the population that's bearing the brunt are the regular people. Mm -hmm. And uh, in no way, shape or form um, can this be considered democratic as a measure, really, because by definition, democratic uh, from the Greek word demos, which means the people. Mm. Uh, and yet they're punishing the people and what can be perceived as an attempt to, you know, make those people turn against the government. Uh, in the meantime, there's one thing that is very clear, uh, that the more American companies pull out of the Russian market, be that temporary or permanently, the more it's dead obvious that this is an all-out economic war. Yes. And it's not our government that's leading it. It's unprecedented. The amount of um, the, the sheer volume of those measures yes. is completely unprecedented. Um, and it's very clear who stands behind it. How are the people of Russia uh, seeing this? Because, you know, in the in the coming days, uh, in the coming days, Tatiana, uh, the uh, the, the, the citizens of Russia will face the heat. Uh, you know, SWIFT, for instance, the effects of that, even though it's only limited to some banks, not all banks yet, uh, you know, there will be partial heat that the people of Russia will start to feel. You know, could that change anything? Change in the in the manner of uniting the people behind the government. Yes, I believe so. Because look, first of all, we have our own paying systems, uh, payment systems mm -hmm. uh, that are in place. And again, we're talking about a huge country, and the only people who are really targeted by this is the part of the population that used to travel a lot. But you and I both understand that's not even close to a majority of Russian people. Mm. In the meantime, inside Russia, everything works. Apple Pay works, despite the fact that they said times and times again that they uh, that you know it, right. it doesn't work. We're stopping. We're we're shutting down. And as you rightly noticed, um, you know, a, a market of that you know magnitude cannot stay empty for a long time. And as much as, you know, the world is used to being, you know, having an iPhone or something like that. But we have, uh, you know, we have the whole of the eastern part of the world, including India, for example, you know, that is very much not boycotting the country. Hmm. And, um, you know, this sensationalization that the news is prone to and, well, you know, it, it's obvious, it's, it's clickbaity that sells makes for you know for good tv but the ma the fact of the matter is that this whole economic war has just done a very obvious thing it's divided the world between the the old west and the east mm. and the east is not even limited to you know india china but it's all of the the whole of the arabic world it is the whole of latin america is brazil a huge country that has not Put any sanctions on Russia that has refused to put sanctions on Russia so far, yeah. and I do believe that um, in the in the long run, it's actually going to be a better thing for uh, you know for the BRICS block in terms of you know the fact that it's just you know it's just putting those same American companies behind in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Tatiana, I want to draw your attention now, you know, to the to the nuclear facilities in Ukraine. You know, we saw what happened in Zaporizhia yeah. a couple of days ago. Uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian government says that Russian forces are looking to uh, uh, to capture some of the other nuclear facilities as well. What can you do? How do you see that? Because uh, you know, there is there is one section that sees that as a, an attempt to kind of throttle or control power output in Ukraine as a means to catalyze movement towards those political objectives in Ukraine. Because if you control electricity and power supply, uh, you know, you, there are many things you can get done quickly. Is that something you're seeing as well? Oh, I know what you're talking about for one specific reason. Let's just, you know, um, just take a, a small detour mm -hmm. uh, because I don't know if I've told you in all of those lives that we've had together. Uh, you know, I grew up in Crimea, so I know exactly how far you can go by controlling uh, the power grid because the Ukrainian side used to control the power grids and the water supplies in Crimea. Right. For instance, in Crimea, back when it was mm -hmm. under Ukrainian rule, you would have cold water in the summer for only two hours a day in some regions you know some cities mm -hmm. so i know exactly what it means but on the other hand look um the russian military has been in control of the zaporozhye power plant and i'm sorry i'm going to speak russian because uh, you know for, for very obvious reasons i'm not going to call those eastern european eastern ukrainian cities by their ukrainian names um the Zaporozhye power plant, which is a huge, huge power plant, one of the largest yes. uh, power plants in the world. I think it's the largest one in Europe, it is. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if they wanted to shut it down, they would have done it two days ago. Um, in, in the, at the same time, you know, you, you would understand why this uh, still keeps going up on the, you know, in the media, mm. appearing, reappearing in the media, because, you know, it makes for a good speculation. Anything connecting, connected to atomic energy or to nuclear energy, you know, yep. it, again, it's clickbaity. It works. But the fact of the matter is... We've been in control of uh, Chernobyl, what's left of it, uh, for, well, almost a week now, I think. Yes, that's right. Um, and the Zaporozhye power plant, again, two full days, maybe even more. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, it's all of a kind of stretched out for, yeah, yeah. for us as well. You know, the people who do the news, it's, uh, it's kind of taxing. Um, if they wanted to do that, it's just the same as, you know, saying that, well, they want to occupy Ukraine. Hmm. Look. We all have seen how you can occupy a country in two days. We've seen it because our American partners have done it so many times. You just bomb stuff, you just literally level the city, and then you control it. Right. And the Russian army is very capable of doing that. And but not that doing is that. not the, mm. the, the, the goal here. It hasn't been. So the control of the nuclear power plants is the very... It's the very essence of, you know, securing very important parts of the infrastructure right. so that there's no possible provocation. Uh, I know that India is quite far away from Ukraine. However, those nationalist brigades that we've been talking about all this time, those people, they literally have, you know, they have nothing sacred. Okay. What, the what are the goals? The sheer... If, if I could ask violence. you, Tatiana, what are the goals in that case? You know, you said, yes, I, the, uh, obviously the Russian military could flatten cities if it needed to, given its vast resources. What are the goals according to you right now? Is it, you know, Russia says that President Zelensky has fled to Poland. What's your view on that? Uh, because he's been speaking to his citizens on a daily basis. What's the end game? What's the objective? Is it regime change? Is it replacing Zelensky? <sighs> Well, let me correct you here. It's not the official position of Moscow. It's one parliamentarian who said that. Right. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not at liberty or nor sure, neither sure. do I consider it ethical to question what he said. But that's that has never been put out as an official position of the, say, the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the, the goal here was very clear from the get go and it hasn't changed. We need to stop the violence. We need to stop a war that was on our doorstep for eight years. Unfortunately, eight years is a long time. And in eight years, I remember the news cycles back in 2014 and everybody was watching what was going on on Donbass. They still blamed Russia. 
But uh, I guess, you know, with the world being very much influenced with American uh, television, American culture, you know, it's, it makes all the sense in the world for now. But in the eight years that it has been happening, unfortunately, it slipped out of the news cycles around the globe. Everybody forgot about the fact that there is war in Donbass. The latest shipment of American lethal aid that they received, he have received uh, at the end of January, the 26th, I think, was 91 ton of military aid, of lethal military aid. We can't talk about it as, as a peaceful country. So okay. the goal okay. here has been, it remains, to demilitarize the country, to stop the violence. Now, if it comes with a regime change, as you call it, you know, it's a very, it's a kind of a slippery subject to begin with. Because right. mm -hmm. if you look at the facts, and I'm not talking about, you know, um, agendas or editorial policies, but if you look at the facts, there was a coup d'etat in 2014. There was, yes. So mm -hmm. whatever power came to power, pardon my English, uh, back in 2014 as a result of a, of a violent and deadly coup d'etat in Kiev was not exactly legal. Okay, okay, understood. I, I, so I, that, I, that is that. I understand what you're saying. Last two questions to you, uh, Tatiana. What about the economic cost to Russia. You know, you've talked about the, the pressures of all these actions that are being taken, the cost of this conflict as well. It isn't, you know, it isn't at any rate a predictable time for the world after the pandemic. You know, what is the overall cost to Russia? Is it acceptable to the people of Russia, the cost of this big conflict and all the repercussions that are piling up against Moscow at this time? Well, I do believe that, first of all, the government uh, was prepared to the, for this. Uh, maybe not at this scope, but um, actually to me as a person who's been in the news business for over 10 years now, it is unimaginable. It's yeah. literally ridiculous, the, um, the scope of, uh, of the war that has been unleashed by, by the U.S., uh, on Russia, just because, you know, uh, if you do something and that's, you know, that's kind of a message that that I think that any country in the, you know, in the eastern um, part of the world can can actually has to listen to it. Because, you know, if you do something that the U.S. deems kind of unfit, that's what's coming, you know, that yeah. amount of pressure. So I do believe that um, in the long run, that's going to be a very good thing for Russia and it's going to be a very good thing for the bloc, the BRICS. Um, countries. In the meantime, again, you know, as much as this issue has been sensationalized by the media, you know, that everybody's leaving. Look, I live in the center of Moscow. Well, you know, more or less. Yeah. Um, I go to the shops. They're not empty. I literally went uh, and bought a dress yesterday from uh, a brand, a British brand that's still staying here. It's not like not all of the brands are leaving, not all of the brands are American brands. Mm. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, where there's a, a, an empty space on the market, as you rightly noticed, there are Chinese brands that would be very happy to fill in that void. Um, as for the economic cost, you know, a different answer and an answer in response, um, a question in response would be, what about the economic cost for Europe? Yeah. Look at the at Britain, for instance. The millions of households already in uh, what's called it's called um, fuel poverty, if I'm not mistaken, mm. Um, mm. and it's gonna get worse because the prices for gas are going sky high. Uh, yeah. Europe cannot survive without Russian gas, and they've literally, uh, you know, they've been doing everything to close that door. So I dare say, well, it's spring now, but after spring comes summer, after summer comes autumn, and then comes winter. And yeah. that winter is going to be really costly for Europeans unless they stop following in U.S. footsteps. The aftermath of this conflict, that's still very much on. It's only on day 11. We don't know when it's going to end. We don't know where it's going to lead. Uh, we don't know if it's going to expand to other countries. Uh, a lot of unanswered questions at this point of time. Uh, who's going to rebuild Ukraine? The economic costs, both for Russia and the rest of the world, are still really being estimated and assessed at this point of time. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a situation that goes way beyond Russia and Ukraine. 
Ukraine. That's perhaps the only thing everyone can actually agree on at this time. Tatiana, always appreciate it. Thank you for being with me live here on India Today.